Uh, hi, Dr. Dorf. Um, can you can you tell us what kind of doctor you are? Uh, so I'm a medical oncologist uh, practicing at the City of Hope and specializing in prostate cancer. So a lot of prostate cancer patients hear medical oncologists and certainly get referred to them. Uh, I mean, and you know, I guess we all have a vague idea, but if you could just like uh, if you were writing for Webster's Dictionary, like what's a medical oncologist? So medical oncologist uh, starts out with broader internal medicine training uh, and then receives additional years of training specifically on hematology, so blood and um, medical oncology cancers. So I think one thing that's important is that the broader training helps us understand things like the cardiovascular system, the renal system, you know, the other aspects of the patient's body um, and how our treatments interplay with those, the effects we have on those other body systems. Uh, Then when we are medical oncologists, we use treatments such as hormone therapy, chemotherapy, immune therapy, and we often serve as sort of quarterbacks for patients who might need multimodal therapy. Someone might need surgery, radiation, and hormone therapy, and so we often coordinate that. So when, let's say in a really simple, cruelish kind of way, when cutting it out and burning out really aren't enough, you're the quarterback, you're the medical specialist who comes into our lives and like helps us live longer. Is that fair to say? Yeah, most commonly that's where we step in. Yeah, that, that must be quite rewarding for you. I mean, you're really touching people at moments in their lives when they're wondering how much longer they have to live. Yeah, I think a lot of us who are medical oncologists were drawn to those sort of intense relationships and being there for people in these very stressful times um, because you do really get to know people and um, feel how what you say, how you interact with them impacts their experience with the cancer. Yeah. In fact, and and how you say, I mean, it's I mean, it sounds simple, but it, in fact, it's quite critical. I mean, particularly for guys who are sort of in, in a heightened awareness of their mortality, you know, I mean, and that they're getting 10 minutes to an hour's worth of your time, but then they don't see you for another period of time, perhaps. Whatever you say lingers in the mind and gets replayed and replayed and replayed. So, I mean, a huge burden on you for having to really understand the impact of your words to a guy with an advanced stage of prostate cancer. Yeah, and I don't think enough people fully appreciate that, how vulnerable a patient is coming in with cancer and how those words can linger. So I often have to do some damage control when I first meet a patient. Um, And it's not that I want to lie to people, but I think there are ways of discussing an illness that are more helpful. And, um, you know, if we want a cancer patient not only to live, but to have quality of life, th- there has to be a balance between reality and hope. And uh, often something as simple as having a plan can help people uh, feel a little calmer and move forward. Um, also making sure not only that we're there for them in those 10 minutes, but when a crisis is arising that patients can reach us, I hear over and over again how much that means to patients and their family members. Yeah, being in, do you share your cell phone number? I mean, is it at at that level? Um, More commonly email, uh, because cell phone I'm gonna tend to ignore if I'm, for instance, in the room with a patient, um, or uh, it might be turned off uh, or not with me during the weekend. And so I think email allows me to pull a patient's chart, understand who it is um, and give them more complete answers. And it's good that we're talking about this. Let's uh, all of us understand what are the very precise ways that doctors engage with us, even when we're not in the room. You know, it's not all just writing a prescription and move on to the next patient. It's actually pulling the chart, reading it before having that conversation. It's sort of understanding uh, the moment that that patient's in uh, and what you could contribute to helping that patient. And that's really hard in a modern practice where you're seeing patients 
uh, so quickly. You don't always have as much time to refresh um, and review. So we rely on our memories a lot, which aren't always perfect. <laughs> um, but patients, as it turns out, are quite forgiving and understanding and recognize our human limitations. So today, let's, I'm very curious of an article that you wrote uh, in a medical journal uh, came out, I guess, a month or two ago, maybe three months ago, uh, about the cost of living with advanced stage prostate cancer. I'm paraphrasing the title a bit, but I mean, within the article, you talked about the various uh, hormone therapies and such uh, for advanced stage patients, but uh, the cost of was the phrase that sort of snapped in my head. What does cost of mean for you as a medical oncologist vis-a-vis -vis your patients? So to put it in context, we wrote a commentary about an article. So the article was using a value framework uh, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, as well as the European Society of Medical Oncology framework, where they have tried to put sort of a value, a price tag of sorts or a, a rating onto these new treatments. So we have lots of treatments that prolong survival. And then we're trying to get at what does that cost society and what does that cost the patient? So these frameworks try to take into account things like side effects, uh, as well as what a patient will pay. But you can imagine how difficult that is given how diverse patients are and how they respond to treatments and what side effects they experience, as well as how diverse insurance coverage is. Uh, so I think it's a valiant effort to try to get at this. Um, but at the heart of it is how can we give better information to our patients? There are layers of cost to patients. There's the time lost from work when they come to clinic appointments. And so treatments that require more visits and more clinic appointments are more costly to that patient. There's also co-pays, obviously, which can be quite high for some of these oral prescription drugs like abiraterone or enzalutamide. Even though they may be covered by insurance, the copay can still be an issue. Uh, there's the cost of side effects uh, in terms of both inability to work or quality of life, and then also cost to the medical uh, sector when there are side effects that result in a patient needing procedures or hospitalization. So it's a very complex landscape. But at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is give a patient a better picture of not only here's drug A, here's drug B, they'll both prolong your survival. But, you know, which one might fit better within their lifestyle, which one might cause them less financial stress, um, which one might result in better quality of life? Yeah. And financial stress, probably, you know, the more concrete and obvious thing in the sense of I have to reach into my wallet or credit card and pay for something. But it also impacts the rest of their lives in that it diverts the ability to pay for other things like food, uh, transportation, uh, a cable bill or an internet bill, um, you know, new underwear, you know, I mean, the, the very basic things of day-to-day -day living that go beyond quality of life. They reach to the essence of life, you know, whether you're just even eating. Even I would argue not just those basics, which are so important, um, but that legacy, right? I don't want to leave my family with a bunch of bills. Um, and we get into really complex questions like, should I adjust my life insurance policy or start making withdrawals based on how long I'm going to live? Um, you know, there are these, should I sell this um, item um, now or should I wait? These, these financial questions that we're really not equipped to handle, but we're trying to guide patients based on what we expect their life expectancy will be, which we're also not particularly good at nailing down. Um, but there is that bigger financial impact, not just the day to day, but what happens to the, their loved ones. So how do you, I mean, just around the financial impact, do you have that conversation with the patient or how does that play out? 
So it takes a whole team. Um, I want to be able to focus on the medicine and the care. Um, I do introduce the concept that there could be a high copay and having seen patients pay a high copay when they maybe didn't have to, um, I try to be diligent about saying, call us. You know, if you get the call from specialty pharmacy and your copay is high, call us, don't pay it. You know, we might be able to help. And then I have a whole team of pharmacy tech a medical assistant who work on all the paperwork to try to knock down to access the patient foundations that help with copay relief or to access the copay cards and those sorts of things. And I think specialty pharmacies are doing a better job by and large of doing that directly with the patient. So some of them will walk the patient through the paperwork rather than um, kicking it back to us. And by specialty pharmacy, what are you referring to? So our expensive cancer medicines have to be um, prescribed through a specialty pharmacy. You can't walk into your regular local pharmacy. They don't want to stock these $10,000 a month drugs. Um, so it's a network of pharmacies that are licensed to, to dispense these medications, and they tend to ship them directly to the house. Or in some cases, they'll ship to your local pharmacy um, as a way of ensuring kind of safe delivery. So around the financial thing, it, it's not that you're their physician. You're almost like a company that they're hiring, you know, your team, so to speak. You know, it's Dr. Dorf and company, you know, and partners or and, fr and friends, you know. Uh, yeah. You know, if a doctor can't get the medicine for their patient, then they they haven't completed their job. And of course, we don't have the, the time to do all that for every patient. So we absolutely need our team. But, you know, if Dr. A and Dr. B both prescribe a drug, but Dr. B has the team that can get that medicine to that patient, you know, at, at a, an affordable copay, then Dr. B has an advantage. Yeah. And is there an advantage to seeing oncologists based in hospitals versus private practice or small practice just around uh, the capacity to help around uh, finding access to medications and treatments? I think there are probably uh, community practices that excel at um, that one-on-one -on -one kind of navigation and getting patients to the end product that they need. And so I don't think it's an academic community divide. I think it's variable. And having an in-house specialty pharmacy, in my experience, has been really valuable. So when I was at USC, uh, once we launched our specialty pharmacy for our patients, I found uh, that patients got their medicines much quicker. Uh, the whole process was much more streamlined. And some community practices now will have their own specialty pharmacies and City of Hope is um, launching one as well because it just takes out that third party sending back the question, does this patient have prostate cancer? Is it metastatic? You know, these little boxes we have to check to get the patient the medicine we prescribed. Um, but when you have your own specialty pharmacy, they're better able to connect to the medical record and get those answers uh, that are very obvious to move the prescription forward. Yeah, I'm very glad you mentioned that because within our support group network, we often hear about patients concerned and feeling cynical about being referred to a variety of uh, various levels of a hierarchy of care. You know, the, the uh, cancer center, then the hospital, then the local hospital, then the community practice, you know, or community center. So, and I think we just fail to understand that, particularly in the advanced stage uh, realms, uh, it's the doctor that matters. I mean, it's not like, you know, uh, a city of hope is going to prescribe a better version of a pill than a local physician. The pill's the same, but the physician, the local physician may have uh, a more economical and faster way to get patients to have access to those drugs or to uh, may just be a brilliant man or woman who just cares so much about their patients that they're spending 22 hours a day focused on help and understanding latest and most effective and durable treatments, et cetera, et cetera. But it, it's good for patients to just have in the back of their head, you're not at you're not necessarily at a deficit if you're not going to the top 10 or top 20 cancer centers in your country, you know, in the United States or Canada or somewhere in Europe, 
you know. Um, I mean, would you agree with that or think what? So I do think that the physician makes a huge difference and mm -hmm. there are outstanding physicians at all different kinds of practices. There are some advantages at a cancer center, things like clinical trials um, that may not be available at a community site. Mm -hmm. um, and I've also heard from some community physicians that certain special treatments, things like Cipulusal T or Provenge, um, that they might have a harder time getting those approved than me as the prostate cancer expert, that when I prescribe it to the same patient, it goes through. So yes and no. I think um, you know if we're going on a very standard treatment and the community physician has a team that can support patients through the copay negotiation process, um, then they can do great. And City of Hope's committed to delivering care where people are. We don't think every patient needs to drive 100 miles to the main cancer center, right? So we have community sites with excellent physicians and support services um, so that we can meet patients where they are. But patients sometimes will feel an advantage to having a, a blended model too, where maybe they get an opinion from an expert um, it, who might understand some nuances and then work with their local oncologist to make sure that the care is optimal uh, because we have the advantage of treating one disease instead of multiple, multiple diseases. So we see it over and over again. We see every iteration. We are involved in the conversation at a national and international level about what's next and what's best practice. Um, so I think there can be some advantages to getting an opinion from a, an academic center. And most community oncologists are really gracious um, about working with us. If we identify a really fantastic clinical trial opportunity, um, they're usually pretty happy to know that their patient could benefit from that opportunity. Or if we just tweak their treatment plan a little bit, they're usually happy to implement that. No, thanks for that optimism and, the, and hope from the City of Hope. You know, <laughs> I mean, how many, I guess everyone at City of Hope is bored with things around that, hearing the word hope <laughs> used. <laughs> anyway, I, Forgive me. <laughs> anyway, but let's take that hope thing into sort of understanding the cost of living longer in terms of quality of life. Because, I mean, I can't think of a more difficult conversation to have with someone that I barely know, meaning like if I had a patient sitting in front of me and saying, am I going to be nauseous for the rest of my life, or am I going to feel uh, tingling in my fingers and feet for the rest of my life? What you know, I mean, is that a life worth living? What what are you know, or with within the for the the what I guess are less new since they've been around a while, you know, the apparatoron, uh, the exalutamide and such, the, and um, the Provenge and all. I mean, the, I mean, I guess it's no longer appropriate to say these are really new drugs. I mean, they've been in our realm for a while now. Are the side effects, are we understanding that the side of the, the quality, the impacts on quality of life are temporary or that's it? You know, once a person experiences something, that's what they're going to experience till their demise. What are your so thoughts? So prostate on? cancer has unique challenges in this realm. Um, for one thing, many patients feel completely fine. And they wouldn't know they had prostate cancer unless they saw their PSA number and looked at their scan and saw spots on the scan that represent metastases. And so quality of life when you're feeling fine is definitely going to be decreased when we start a treatment that has side effects. The other thing that's so unique about prostate cancer and side effects is the whole sexual function domain because our hormonal therapies really impact libido they impact sexual function. Uh, and so these can impact relationships. Um, and that's a, a conversation that we don't have often enough, I think. How are you coping with this huge change in something that was a big part of your life that we're now taking away as we take away your testosterone? How are you and your partner coping with it? So it's important to have access to support groups where men can get a lot of information and partners can get a lot of information about what it's like to be in these relationships where sexual function may be permanently changed. You know, it's not in some cases, we use short term and it's going to be a reversible situation. 
But for other men, for men with metastatic cancer, it's more likely this is going to be a permanent change. And that's a really tough one. In terms of other aspects of quality of life, I think it's really important to remind people that in some cases, the cancer is causing them to feel sick. And so the treatments we give can actually improve quality of life. So even though a drug may have side effects, even something like chemotherapy, which is known to have quite strong side effects, when you actually score the boxes on a quality of life survey, you can often see that people are feeling much better when we are treating their cancer, even using these very strong medicines. Uh, so something like abiraterone or enzalutamide, in my view, and it's easy to say because I'm not the one with the cancer, I'm not the one feeling the day-to-day -day side effects and taking these pills, but in my view, having been treating prostate cancer for 15 years and having seen men live and men unfortunately die, what I see is that these drugs significantly prolong life and they significantly improve quality of life. And that's not just my perception, there's data to support that. So we know that when we treat the cancer well, we have less bone pain, we have fewer fractures, men stay on their feet, mobile, able to do what they want to do longer. So um, I think what I see in the literature in terms of the numbers, I really see play out day to day in my own patients. And, um, and also there's like uh, the radiation, radiological Inter uh, like Sofigo and things. Those also, I mean, do you all have share a similar kind of, uh, do you see a similar profile and experience, uh, less pain, longer life from those, that class of drugs? That group of yeah, drugs? yeah, for sure. Bone targeting is critical since most of prostate cancer patients suffer most from their bone involvement. Um, making sure we hit that hard is, is key and, and, Radium-223, which is Zofigo, certainly has been shown to reduce pain and prolong survival. And one of the pieces of data that I thought was interesting from the radium experience was that there were fewer hospital days. I think that's something most cancer patients would want, you know, less time in the hospital. Is there a way, uh, we've, we're asking this of a number of our guests uh, during this uh, festival this, uh, for prostate cancer patients. Is there a way for a patient to have some way to predict how much longer they're going to live? There are some milestones, I would say. Um, generally, it can be very hard. I mean, we have these wide ranges, right? On average, when you're starting out with metastatic prostate cancer and we treat you with testosterone lowering and a drug like abiraterone or enzalutamide, we know your cancer should be controlled on average for something like three years. But that means there's the guy whose cancer progresses at a year and the guy who seven years later is still totally controlled, right? So we have some milestones that help us narrow that. And so I always tell my patients, I can give you a broad median range right now, but we're going to get to know your cancer as we treat it because how it responds really impacts how well you're going to do, how long you're going to live. So we know at seven months or in some series, 12 months, the PSA going all the way down below 0.2 divides out who's going to do better and who's going to do worse. Um, we also have some, um, blood test parameters that can help us understand who's got more aggressive disease and even some more sophisticated, you know, DNA profiling um, or gene expression kinds of assays that we can employ. Um, but th the biggest um, question really for patients is, am I getting close to the end? And that one can be hard. Men can be doing fine for a while and then all of a sudden something changes. Um, so, you know, those kinds of milestones are the milestones like going in and out of the hospital, needing blood transfusions on a regular basis and those sorts of things. Yeah. And from your experience, you know, in a general sort of way, and if you have anecdotes, please feel encouraged to share those. But the idea of you've seen men from the moment they enter your office first time till their death, you know, do you feel, is there a way to understand men like living longer or they wish they didn't have these interventions that extended their life, you know, with, you know, vis-a-vis -vis quality of life and such. So I see men with all different opinions and values and feelings about this. So I have had patients who value 
feeling like themselves and having sexual function over length of life and will make a different decision than a man whose number one concern is living as long as possible because he wants to see his grandkids, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, so it's really important for physicians to listen to their patients and engage in those conversations. You know, this drug will help you live longer. Um, it may cost you this. These are the kinds of side effects we see. In my experience, quality of life is blah, blah, blah. Um, and then help a patient through it um, as we see their individual sort of reaction to a treatment. And, you know, I always try to reassure patients, if we do chemo, I know chemo is scary. You hear bad stories probably from friends and family about how tough it is. Everyone's reaction to chemo is different. If we give you a dose of chemo and it's terrible, we can always stop. We're not committed to keep doing it. it you will feel better. These side effects will reverse. So as we close this in a wonderful conversation, what question or questions do you wish patients would ask more often? Um. I think most patients really these days are coming in equipped um, and ask a lot of good questions. And honestly, it's really more that we don't always have as optimal answers as we'd like to have. Like, what is my day to day going to look like on this treatment? That's just really hard. You know, we can only speak in generalizations as what we see, knowing that they're always outliers. Um, but I do want patients to ask about supplements. Um, I think it's critical that your doctor knows what supplements you're interested in, what supplements you're taking. Sometimes they're going to interact with the treatment. And if we don't have an understanding of what you're on, then we can't be sure that what we're doing is safe. We're often very open to supplements, but I think give your doctor that opportunity. So ask the question, say, hey, I'm on these supplements. Is that okay? Let's extend this just another minute or so, because the, so I could hear in the virtual audience, lots of <laughs> guys saying, wait a minute, are you saying if I, I could take a bunch of vitamins and live longer? You know, I mean, is there something around that or some combination of like, a, well, not vitamin D and docetaxel, but, you know, so, which is not a good thing from a study. But the, uh, I mean, are there things that you're exploring in your own research or hear about or might consider for patients who are into complementary opportunities? So there's woefully inadequate data to tell us whether these are beneficial or not, right? So most of these are, are being sold by companies that want to make money, let's be honest. And there's often some anecdotal like, oh, my brother took this and he did great. Um, so there's not a lot of data. So it's not that we're often recommending, um, although there are some scenarios, uh, such as a rising PSA after surgery, before one might jump in with hormone therapy, there are some supplements that have been studied very rigorously in that setting. Um, things like the white button mushroom, the pomegranate, the... Um, prostate health cocktail, soy, a few others. So there might be, I do have conversations with men in that situation about, hey, if you want to try something to try to slow PSA down, these are some things that have been shown to potentially help you with that. Um, but the bigger issue, again, is just making sure we know what supplements you're on because there are some that do these natural supplements, these herbs, we think they have power to do good, but we forget that that means they also have power to do bad. And that's the reality. You know, there are herbs that can hurt your liver. There are herbs that can make your abiraterone ineffective <laughs> or too toxic. And we just want the opportunity to have that conversation with patients. Excellent. Well, thank you. Uh, I mean, as in all things prostate cancer, it's as we term it it's a kick in the ass to think about your life you know and uh even when you're at advanced stage your life continues just as it did 10 years earlier when you may not have had a diagnosis uh the ability to sort of consider 
who you are is important and good to have doctors like Dr. Dorf who are open to those conversations and to offer you help in finding realms to express yourself. So um, thanks very much for uh, chatting with us today. And well, well, welcome to our conference. <laughs> Thank you so much.